meteor fall into Lake Michigan 300 years ago. One was a Potawatomi brave hunting among the dunes. He saw the fire streak fall into the lake and was afraid because it was an omen of ill favor when the stars left the heavens and drowned themselves in the great water. The other was a sturgeon who snapped eagerly at a fragment of the meteor as it fell. The big fish took it into his mouth and then spat it out again in disdain. The meteor drifted down through the cold black water and disappeared. The sturgeon swam away and presently he died. Eight of the fifth, fifty-eight, three p.m. Air temp thirty-two, water temp let's see, twenty-eight. Wind light variable, wave action diminishing, absence of drifted specimens. Hey, Ian, you knew he through. No, I don't know, Willie. Just check up on the far end of the pool. My stomach's beginning to feel like lunchtime. And I didn't drag myself out to this godforsaken place just to sit starving on the shore of Lake Michigan watching you fool around with a few beaten up old bugs. Oh, well, just be patient for a few minutes, Willie. You'll get your lunch. Uh, you're in the hydrophilidy hiding under the rubbish. Some kind of larvae by that piece of board. Could you pass the collecting bottle, Willie? You never know. Yeah, here you are. Thanks. Now. Good, we'll have a look at that later. Good Lord, what's that? What's the matter? Nipped by a crab? There's a little flash of light down there. Huh? You see? By that piece of rock. Oh, uh, probably a pebble or something that caught the sun for a moment. No, it's not a pebble. Wait a minute. Got it. It's beautiful. Like a marble with a tail on it. Or a drop of amber. But there are tiny flecks and streaks running through it. And it's so smooth and clear. Well, but quite useless. So, it's worth keeping for the private museum. It can go between the rusty old yak bell and the six-inch copper sulfate. <laughs> Bring it in, you'll be able to charge admission. Hey, looks as though we're going to have visitors. I thought you said you were supposed to be a hermit. Well, that's a car in Max Cruiser. You remember you spoke to him last night? Last night? Oh, the radio ham. He's got someone with him. He'll run aground if he's not careful. Hey, Max, look out for the sandbar. The last storm brought it in. Don't go to the Good old Mac, he never misses a week. Cars out right on time every Monday. Brings my mail and my copy of the biological journal. And most important, the bottle of scotch. Looks as though he's excelled himself this time. Why, the sly old dog. He never told me there was anything like that in his life. <laughs> Don't just stand there gaping. Anyone would think you'd never seen a girl before. Ground helper should get her feet wet. Here. Want your visitor this time here? Let me give you a hand, Max. Hey, here. You too, Miss. Oh, thank you. Hey. This gentleman in the exotic colored shorts and baseball cap is Dr. Ian Thorne, the distinguished writer and lecturer. He's English, but he can't help that. He writes books about dune ecology, whatever that is. Ian, my niece, Miss Wright. I'm very glad you could come over, Miss Wright. Oh, I'm engaging an ecologist with a leer. Uh, we're not really bad fellows at heart, Miss Wright. It's the fresh air gives us the point of ears. Oh, I see. Ian. Oh, well, uh, this is Willie Seppel. He's a biophysicist and works over at Ann Arbor. Quite a scientist convention. Well, I must say you picked a pretty desolate spot for it. How do you do, Mr. Temple? How do you do? And welcome ashore, Miss Wright. Uh, but I'm here strictly to relax. I just sit around the shore watching Ian work. Were you collecting specimens here today, Dr. Thorne? Not exactly. You see, I'm preparing a chapter on the ecology of beach pool associations. And this little pool has my guinea pig. It'll soon be cut off by that sandbar. Then the stagnation increases, progressive forms of animal and plant life will inhabit it. Algae, beetles, All you have to do is charge him up and he's on the air for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> I've got your present in if you're interested. What is it, mail? Something a heck of a lot more digestible. A couple of steaks. I persuaded Jan to come along and do them up for us. I've tasted your pretty. Well, I can burn a chop as well as the next man. Let's go down to the shack. I live just on the shore, Miss Wright, in a place perched on top of the sand dune. It's rugged, but it's home. And rugged is the word, Mr. Wright. One hundred and thirty steps to the top. Come on, I'll lead the way. You have no dunes in England, Dr. Thorne. It seems a long way to come to fill a few collecting bottles. There are no dunes in England like these, Miss Wright. 
Did you ever watch them? They're like great creeping monsters. If it went for the pines, they'd sweep over farms and forests and leave nothing to show for it. No, but how? The winds do it. Look, you see that valley among the sand hills? Yes, Erie. That's all so dead, those horrible little white stumps. The dunes at the end of the valley are moving. The little white stumps are dead trees. The hills buried them there years ago and then moved on and left their skeletons. They were probably young oaks. Of course, things. It's frightening. underestimate yourself, Dr. Thorne. This is no shack. It's a real home. Oh, the view is magnificent. You can see for miles. When the wind blows a gale off the lake, you think the house will be carried away. Sometimes I wish it would. At least I wouldn't have to climb those steps up here every week. Still, it's just the place for work. I can't tell you, Ian, how I envy you this place. No neighbors, no decent roads, no telephone either. Telephone? But Uncle says he talks to you every day. Come through into the next room. I'll show you something. I've never seen so many valves and wires in my life. You earned money on the side breaking up old radio sets? Private radio used to be my hobby when I was a kid. Now it keeps me in touch with the outside world. I met Mac over the years, long before I saw him in the flesh. Well, you must have seen his station at home. He even has a low-power rig in the launch. Yeah, I've seen it. You mean he talks to you any time he wants to? Well, it's not like a telephone. The other fellow has to be listening for you on your frequency. But your uncle and I keep a regular schedule every evening. Uncle spoke of you as some sort of a scientific hermit, but I'm beginning to think he was wrong. Maybe, maybe not. Sometimes I sit up here all day by myself with nothing but the dunes for miles around. Nothing to hear but the wind. I begin to feel I'm as out of it all as those dead trees out there. Oh, come on, let's go back before Mac finishes off the scotch. No, if you like. Well, thank you for showing me your radio station. Think nothing of it. Scotch tastes like iodine. It's the only alcohol in the place unless you want to try the specimen pickle. No, thanks. I might end up looking like one of those old toads over there. What's this little golden thing in the bottle? Uh, something I found in the beach pool this afternoon. I don't know what it is. Probably turned out to be part of an old nectar somebody threw away ten years ago. Oh, it's rather pretty. It'll make a lovely bandit. You can have it if you like. I'll fish it out for you. There you are. Look. That's like a piece of Venetian glass. Oh, it's lovely, thank you. Well, look how it gleams in the sunlight. I've never seen anything so beautiful. David? You the bug man? You the English bug man? Well, I suppose I am. Come on in. Now then, what can I do for you? There's this here toad I found. I think it's sick. Well, bring it over to the table here where I can see it in the light. Here you are. Can you fix it up, mister? I don't know until I have a look at it. Let's see now. It's dead, ain't it? I'm afraid so. Must have been nearly dead when you found it. What was the matter with it, mister? Well, I could tell you if I dissected it. You want to wait here while I do it? I guess so. You get yourself something to drink. You'll find some bottles in the icebox. Thanks. The kids say you never talk to anyone. They say you just sit out here and look at bugs all the year round. Mm-hmm. Gosh, whatever happened to its inside? It's gone all black and funny. Why did it die? Its heart stopped. Gee. Hey, what, what are those two little golden drops you just taken out of him? Is that gold? Oh, it's just something he swallowed. I, is that what killed him? Maybe. Or oh, perhaps he just died of old age. Oh. I'll tell you what, we'll drive you home in the Jeep. Would you like that? Guess so. Poor old Toad. I opened it up and inside its stomach were two little golden drops just like the ones I gave to Jean. What do you make of it, Matt? Bye, Mac. This is W-A-G-B over to W-A-T-B-Z, and W-A-T-B is out clear. Good night, Mac. W-A-T-B-Z, I can clear. 
And then her love. Nice. Pretty good for a week and a half. Is the anchorite going to come out of his wilderness at long last? Jan's a sweet kid, Willie, but... Oh, I don't know. She doesn't understand. Doesn't understand what, for God's sake? That the hermit's been in his cell too long. He doesn't want to come out. Yeah, and to hear you talk, anyone would think you're 95 instead of 35. 36. All right, so 36 then. Look, Willie, it's as if the sand walls had grown up around me too. I've been, I've been living among the dead trees too long. Oh, what the hell. <laughs> I'll get the scotch. Hey, by the way, what are you going to do with these drops? The ones from inside the toes. Well, I don't know. Wait around till I get a few more and string them into a necklace for Jeanne, maybe. She's wearing the one I gave her as a pendant, huh? Mm. Here's your scotch. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Ian, I've been thinking, why don't you let me take those drops over to the guys at Ann Arbor and let them look them over? They might find out something. Well, surely they're not worth all their trouble. Ooh, wouldn't take a day. I could take the train down there tonight. I must admit, they've got me pretty interested. Particularly after the way they chewed up that toad's stomach. You can't tell me that was natural. No, that's true enough. Maybe you're right. We should get them analyzed. If you like, I'll drive you down to the station right away. There's a train in about half an hour. And I'll be back day after tomorrow. If they've finished their test by then, that is. Uh, have you got a tobacco can or something I can put them in? You'll find one on the magazine rack. We'd better get a move on. They said there'd be a storm tonight. It looks like it's on the way. I'll get the car. Somewhere down by the lake. Can't seem to see it. It's going to be a storm. <laughs> Big storm. Where's the bottle? Hey, mister. What's that? Who is it? You all right, mister? I saw you stumbling about. I thought maybe you were hurt or something. Well, I'm all right, sure enough, boy. Just lost my role, that's all. Where are you making for? Poor grandson. Poor grand. What? I want to see those fruit boats ship out of Port Grand just once more. But Port Grand's 15 miles away. You'll never make it tonight. I made 500 miles in three days, boy. Truck drivers. Lousy, stinking bunch. Okay, so he likes the Detroit Tigers. How was I to know? Did he have it written up on a neon sign or something? But what happened? He kicked me out. 15 miles from home. After he drunk half the whiskey. You drunk, mister? Darn no rain. The fire is in the road. Well, not far. Just a few hundred yards down the hill. I'll show you. What are you doing up here, anyway? I heard you singing. I I was on the road. I've been fishing. I, I shouldn't be out this late. Come on, boy. Keep moving. The rain's coming down fast. Where's the road? Thought you said it was only a few hundred yards. It got so dark. I can't see it. Oh, all these bushes. Quick, get a move on. The trees over there, they might... Oh, what the hell? Hey, what happened? Where are you? I've fallen down the slope. Now give me a hand. What's the matter? Why can't you get up? Oh, my foot hurts. And I'm caught in this bush. I can't move. Give me a hand. Here. Oh, oh you're, you're so heavy. My back hurts. I must be lying on a stone or something. Pull. Well, can't you help? I can't get free my foot. You're getting so wet. The road's only just down there. I can see it. What's the matter? What is it? Somebody coming. There's, there's a light on the lake. A big light. It's coming towards the shore. Oh. So big. It's coming onto the shore. Oh, quick, come. We must run. Oh, here, help me up. Come on, pull. Oh, I can't. You're too heavy. Oh, come on, try, damn you, pull. He's right. He's coming in. He's here. He's coming this way. He's coming after us. Look. Look. Quick, quick, get me loose, get me loose. I can't. I can't. Help. Help. Come back here. Come back. Help me, help me. Well, 
worked on the lake for 40 years, but never, never did I see a storm like the day. Are you finished, Doc? Well, nearly through, Sheriff. No, sir, I guess we won't forget that one in a hurry. <clears throat> Have you found anything in these clothes, Sam? Yeah, a wallet. Doesn't seem to be much in it, though. A few bucks and... Yeah, here's the Siemens International card. Now, let's see, Sam. Uh, George Sandbergen of Port Grand. Uh, you know Mr. Thorne? But, <laughs> no, I suppose you wouldn't. No, I didn't know. Uh, I know him. Uh, yes, let me see. Um, Zandbergen, Gimpy Zandbergen. Appendicitis in 46. Left sometime soon after then. I think he used to be an oiler in one of the boats in the fruit fleet. Oh, thanks, Doc. Did you get that, Sam? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Thorne... Uh, We'll have to have your story for the record, of course. I hope it won't take too long. I don't think it showed us so much to tell. I was driving back from the station along the old wagon road. I'd been to see a friend off. The storm was still pretty bad. I almost missed seeing the tramp. I thought he was a fallen branch at first. He's lying in a twisted-up sprawl position. Uh, was there anything around the body to give any idea of what might have killed him? Ooh, well, not much doubt about that one, Sheriff. Third degree burns on 50% of the body area. See it to the bone and parts of the face and about the right scapula. Mm -hmm. Verdict's accidental death, I'd say. Poor devil was struck by lightning. Time death, about 9 p.m. Yeah, that seems fair enough. All right, cover him up, Sam. Yep. This lightning's pretty odd stuff now. It can blow the soles off a man's shoes without hurting him or generate enough heat to melt a metal. Now, take this guy here. One side of him is broiled black and the other's not even thin. Well... Never know, do you? Oh, he won't keep you any longer tonight, Mr. Thorne. Just let me know how I can get in touch with you. Through McInnes, he'll be glad to contact me on his home radio station. Oh, you don't say. I used to have a ticket for that racket myself in the old days. Well, I'll be dropping in to see your rig one of these days, if, if you don't mind. I bet you could use a bit of company out in those dunes, huh? Yes, I could. Drop in any time. Good night, Sheriff. Good night, Mr. Thorne. Mind how you go. Uh, if you find any more of those guys lying around, drive right past them. I've had enough for one night. Hello, Seppel speaking. Well, the train was held up by the storm. Something had blocked the line, I think. I, I just got in. I heard the phone ringing on the way up. But where are you ringing from, anyway? Just outside the sheriff's office. You want me to come and bail you out? Billy, I found another one. Another what? Another of the golden drops. Only this one wasn't just a drop. It was the size of a grapefruit. And it was underneath a dead man. What? I found him not far off the road on the way back from the station. Burnt, badly burnt. The sheriff seemed to think it was lightning, but I'm convinced the gold ball had nothing to do with it. You mean it killed him? No, I don't think so. He was lying on top of it. There were a few little scorch marks where it had touched his suit, but not enough to do any harm. It was his chest and face that were burnt, as if a great flame had gone right over him. But what about the ball? Was it hot? No, that's the strange thing about it, when he was stone cold when I found him. I put it in my pocket. I didn't think the sheriff would make anything of it, and I wanted to keep the specimen anyway. Maybe it's just a coincidence, but... Yeah, it was exactly the same as the other ones you found. Uh, the one you gave Jeanne, and the ones I've got here with me now. Except that it was so much bigger. Hmm. And it was misshapen. There was a cavity in it, just about the shape of a shoulder blade, where he'd been lying on it, I suppose. Hmm. It's strange, you know. You know the way those little ones are flecked inside with gold? Yeah. Well, on this one, you can see what the flecks really are. It's as if there was a fine network of metallic threads just beneath the surface. How long will it be before you can get a report? A oh, day or so. Can't tell, really. With luck, I may be back day after tomorrow. In any case, I'm anxious to see the new specimen. But look, if it's all you say it is, I should be careful what you do with it until I've found out a little more about this one. Come in. I'm sorry to drop in so early in the morning, but Mac was taking the boat over to Port Grand. He'll give you a lift. I'm glad to see you at any time, Sam. Well, sounds like it. You're about as welcoming as one of your fickle specimens. Oh, by the way, there was a telegram in your box. What did it say? No, 200,000 old plus what? Can't wait to see Big Daddy arrive noon Thursday, Los Angeles. Any idea what it all means? Not much. 
what's that you're playing with, anyway? Oh, it looks like the big brother of my pendant, but... It's all out of shape. It looks sinister. It's almost as though there were thin gold veins running all through it. It's sinister, all right. Oh, what do you mean? Where did you get it, and what are you trying to do with it, anyway? Just at this very moment, my dear, I'm going to give it a crack with this car lever. I want to see if I can split it open. Maybe you'd better stand clear, just in case. Ian, don't you think you'd better let it alone? No, I'll be all right. Here goes. Oh, it's a bit harder next time. Would you believe it? The damn thing just bounced off. Made another dent in the ball, but otherwise the thing might just as well be made of lead. But it looks a fragile. Now, well, let's see what it's done to the car lever. God, it's hot. Here, let me see. Oh, would have to grab hold of the thing. You're going to have a nasty burn. Have you got anything I can fix it with? Here, yeah, yeah, look in the cupboard. Well, at least I know what Willie's telegram means now. Well, you would have to try your strength out on the thing. Well, it can stay right there under the table until Willie comes back. I'm not going to tamper with it until I know for certain what it can do. But the glowing thing that lay underneath the table among the leaves and trash was not hot. It grew momentarily more golden, and with a deliberate liquid ripple, the ugly bulges on its surface smoothed, and it assumed the perfect drop shape of its predecessor. Well, you're very smart, don't you, Willie? If you'd only spent a little more money on your telegram, I wouldn't be walking around with my hand with a bandage. You can't complain. The same thing happened to one of the boys over at Ann Arbor. He took one look at one of those drops and tried to knock its tail off with a chisel. <laughs> anyway, you can count yourself lucky. Think of what happened to the poor old toad. To say nothing of the poor old tramp. Anyway, what about the toad? Did they burn him up too? Well, well, what? I've been sitting in that chair half an hour drinking my scotch and I've been doing all the talking. What have you found out? Look, do you have a step-down transformer? Yes. Oh, good. Get it. Right over here in the bookcase. Ian, they found the drops give off long infrared, mostly stacked around 200,000 angstroms. But their energy is way out of proportion to what you'd expect. Here you are. Now, oh, thanks. Now, this little gadget I've got here is something I've rigged up to measure it crudely. Now, you put the drop in here. Oh, wire this up, please. All right, that's it. Good. Now, I'll press this little trigger. That rod gives the drop a smack, and we get some sort of measurement on this little screen. Now, watch. <laughs> Bad, isn't it? You see the way the waves are dancing up and down on the screen? Yes, but the energy output's still quite small, isn't it? Well, it's surprisingly big for an object this size. We think that glowing heart thing inside has something to do with it. And, and those little gold threads. The ones like little veins. Yeah. They come in there, too. You know, old Canestries was visiting the university. He says the glow is something that will have physicists crawling up the wall. Oh, come now, Willie. Ah, you just wait. We haven't done the analysis, but we expect great things. Now, let's see the other specimen, the one you found last night. Gimby Zamberger, it's in the drawer of the work table. There it is. Hey, this is wonderful. It's almost the size of my fist. Now we can... Oh, no, no, we this. can't. We're going to leave this one strictly alone. My hand still hurts like hell. But there's another thing. When I first found it, it was irregularly shaped. Hmm. Lumpy, ugly. It's smooth now, just like the others. But it changed right before my eyes. It just seemed to run fluid and then coalesce again in, into the drop shape. I don't think we'll mention that to the boys at Ann Arbor yet. We'd be put away. Uh, what about the heat, the tire lever, and your friend's chisel? It's easily possible. Infrared rays aren't hot in themselves, Ian. But when they penetrate a material, their wavelength is increased. The energy given out heats the material. In the case of the tire iron, the conductivity of the metal was greater than that of your hand. You felt the warm iron before the skin itself was affected. The iron wasn't warm, Willie. It was damn hot, and in a matter of seconds... Uh, I don't know what to say. The funniest thing I've ever run across. The little tramp didn't think it very funny. You don't think this little thing killed him, do you? You said he was charred to a cinder all along one side. What kind of infrared could do a thing like that? I didn't say this one killed him. <laughs> too wild for me. <sighs> My bedtime. 
We can worry about this tomorrow, huh? Here yeah, we will. We'll put the big one in the drawer, get ourselves a snack, and go to bed. Wouldn't it be better off in a pail of ice? <laughs> if it did decide to give off heat, it would probably melt the pail before it melted the ice. And besides, they never radiate unless they're disturbed. Come on. Let's go and see what you've got in the ice box. out on the porch. Well, why in hell don't you go and see what it is and let me sleep? Well, oh, fine, help you. I'm going to put on the light. No. No, nothing. Yeah. Look outside. Mm. Nothing. Mm. The window's closed and the door's shut. Good God! What's happened now? The outside door, there's a hole burned right through the bottom of the door. Oh, Winnie, there's a hole right... Heard. Yes, I heard you. I'm coming. Put on the porch light. Hey, you're right. Quite a neat little job. Still blowing around the edges. The bowl. Where do we put it? Quick. It's gone. What do you mean it's gone? You. you... Huh? There's another little hole in the bottom of the drawer. Hey, you better throw that whole thing in the sink. It's still burning. Never radiate unless they're disturbed. It looks as though we've got a good deal more to learn. Hmm. First on the list, we'd better find out where our little friend has roamed off to. Uh, it won't be light for another hour. Let's get dressed and have a bite to eat. With luck, it should have left a trace in the sand. It's been easy so far. As long as the ball was plugging away uphill, it made a good deep track. Might be so easier with the other side of this dune. Oh, well, nearly at the top anyway. At least I think so. Why does it take so long to get light? I can still just about follow it downhill. It looks as if it's going down towards the lake. Look, you can see the track by those trees. Yes, but where after that? I can't see. Just past the trees, there's another track. Golly, just look at it. Three feet wide. The big track must be three feet wide. The little track we're following goes right down to meet it. It merges into it. Just look at the trees down there. They're all crushed flat like a, a steamroller went over them. Let's go down and have a closer look. Yeah. I can't believe it. Look, the big track goes right on down to the lake. Mm -hmm. See how clear it is across the wet sand? And just look at the place where the two tracks meet. The big one goes much deeper into the sand, as if whatever made it hung around for a while, waiting for the little one to come along. Just imagine the size of an object that could make a three-foot track in soft sand. I remember Mac told me there used to be an old story about a dune roller. His grandmother used to tell it. A dune roller as big as a schooner that lived in the caves in the bottom of the lake. It came out of the lake every hundred years and roamed through the dune forest looking for a man. 
When he found one, it would stop rolling and sink back into the lake. Well, you'd better quit mooning over old wives' tales and get down to collecting some concrete evidence. Looks as though you're going to have to do without your door for a day or two. Friday was a quiet day in the dunes country, but the police did receive three minor complaints. A farmer charged that someone had not only made off with and eaten three of his best laying hens, but had burned the feathers and bones and left them right in the chicken yard. The county highway commission wanted to know who was building fires in the middle of their asphalt roads and plastering their landscape with hot tar. And a maiden lady complains that the artists in the local summer colony must be holding wild orgies again from the look of the lights she had seen over there at 3 a.m. Getting pretty late, huh? Sorry, you said you were just in time for a shopping trip. Well, that was what I thought, too, but there was a movie I wanted to see, and somehow time just went by. I didn't realize how late it was. Oh. Well, is the boat still here, Joe? Yep, still where you left it. Well, just as well, that uncle of yours would be hopping mad. Is Mac Mo, you've taken it? Well, he does know. I didn't tell him I'd be on the lake at night, though. Sounds like somebody's having a good time. Well, it's just a party of crazy youngsters having a beach party out in the bay. They're just warming up to it now. Oh, well, I'd better be off. Bye, John. Thanks for keeping an eye on the boat. Oh, thank you, Miss. a film now and then. Oh, it's no use, I suppose. You'll just sit in that little house among the dunes looking over the day's captive bugs. No, oh, I don't know. Eleven o'clock. Generally, the time he has his late night talk with Uncle. I wonder whether I can pick it up on the short wave on the receiver here. Oh, let's try. with a searchlight somewhere about... Remember that number dropped me from Max when I hit you, John? Well, he thinks we may be onto a big scientific discovery. I've got it at last. It took me long enough. There's still that light on the lake. It seems to be getting bigger. We found that the drops give off hot light when they're disturbed. And by hot, we mean hot. We think there may be drops big enough to give out energy 40 dB above S9. Something about a big one. Big as a pineapple, she says, and you burning your hand on it. Burnt my hand? The night before last, it got loose and burnt a hole in the door. Willie insisted on taking off the door to keep it an exhibit. It's been pretty cold at night lately. Did you find it again? The ball, I mean. No, but we followed its tracks over the dunes down almost to the shore. Then we found what it had gone to meet. There was a track in the sand three feet wide going down to the lake. Three feet wide. Somewhere in the lake, there must be a real monster. Mac, you having trouble? All right, this end. Sounds as if someone's trying to get through, but I don't see... Ian, Ian, can you hear me? John, John, is that you? Where are you? She must be on the boat. She took it off this afternoon. John, what's the matter? Ian, yeah, there's a great gold spear. It's following the boat. I think it's after me. It's you. Ian, it's pretty foot high, and it's been standing out here. John, listen to me. I don't know if this is really good, but you must try it. You hear me? Yeah, I hear you, Ian. Quickly, the thing's almost on top of the wall. Listen to me, darling. Do you have the little amber drop I gave you? Yeah, Ian. It's right my neck. Throw it overboard. Throw it as far as you can. Do you hear me? Yes, I
golden light rode high in the lake. And then the small drop arched brightly over the water, even as the meteor had many centuries past. The great golden sun. Willie, I'm convinced the thing that chased John is the one that killed the tramp. And we know now that it was the drop it was after. But how and why? What if it gives off something as well as infrared? After all, infrared doesn't see a flesh. Some kind of energy, perhaps, that the drops can focus into a beam. If that were so, then... You still sitting here talking like this. Willie, I'm going mad. Why do they tell us something from the hospital? Yeah, and you know Mac will let us know as soon as he can. And it was no use you just hanging around the hospital waiting for news. Oh, Jan will be okay, I'm sure of it. You haven't had any sleep and you're just worrying yourself silly. Willie, uh, stop thinking about it. Keep talking about the Doom Roller, if that'll take your mind off, Jan. I'll try. You think they communicate in some way? Oh, sympathetic vibration, call of the wild. But that thing did follow Jeanne because of the pendant. And it looks as though it went away when it got what it wanted. If only we could be sure. The tramp was unlucky enough to fall on top of one of them. And the big one rolled over him trying to get it. David? Oh, excuse me. Is uh, one of you gentlemen Dr. Ian Thorne? I'm Ian Thorne. Go on in. Thank you. I'm sorry to bother you, Dr. Thorne, but I think you may be able to help me. My name's Cunningham, commander of the Coast Guard Cutter, Man of Steak. Won't you sit down, Commander? Thanks. Hi. Dr. Thorne, at 11.15 last night, your amateur station contacted our base that the cruiser Carlin was in difficulty off the mainland. It wasn't me, it was Kirk McInnes. We found the cruiser drifting out of gas somewhere off the port Grand Light. His right was found lying unconscious on the cockpit floor. Yes. I've just seen her, and the doctor says she's suffering from shock. But other than that, they can't find a thing wrong with her. Now, what I'd like to know... Is she conscious? Has she been able to talk? She's very weak, and what she says makes no sense. I thought perhaps you might be able to help us on that score. We were talking with her over the radio when suddenly she seemed to become disturbed and evidently fainted. Didn't McInnes tell you anything, Commander? No. She seems to be trying to tell us that something was chasing her. Are you sure she said nothing over the radio that could give some hint of what happened? Well, I knew there was something wrong from the sound of her voice, that's all. Did you find anything, anything on the water near the boat? The lake was empty. Was there uh, something you expected us to find, Dr. Thorne? Certainly not. I was just wondering. I see. I don't mind telling you I think there's something you're not letting me know. Something scared the hell out of that girl on the lake. If you know what it is, I wish you'd tell me. Cigarette, sir. Thanks. Commander... Have you ever read any science fiction? Do you mean to say the lake's been invaded by little green men who spend all their time chasing after girls in boats? No, not exactly. Look, but... Commander, I don't like to mince words. I think I do know what was out there on the lake last night, but I'm not going to tell you. I can't prove it, and I have an intense aversion to being laughed at. I have no intention of laughing, Dr. Thorne. But if you have information relative to marine safety, let me remind you that you have an obligation to report it to the proper authorities. The proper authorities? They're not notorious for their sympathy. They'd laugh in my face. No, thank you, Commander. Until I have proof, I'll say nothing. Now, if you've nothing further to ask me, I'm going to take the jeep down to the hospital. Goodbye, Commander. Well, I'll be... <laughs> Commander Thorne's okay, even if he is a little mule-headed. At the moment, he's too worried about this right to think clearly at all. But it seems to me you ought to know a little more about this. Mm -hmm. Look, make yourself at home. Have another cigarette. Have a drink. Chew some gum. I'm going to tell you a very singular story. Oh, yummy. Real appetizing. That should do it. Willie, what on earth is going on in there? Look, I'm the last to criticize another man's cooking. Will you tell me what in heaven's name that is? Oh, just some digestive juice. Uh, that's enough, I think. Well, pass me the pot holder, will you? Anything, so long as you don't expect me to get within range of that revolting mess you've got in there. Here you are. Oh. I said I'd better not ask you where you got it from. Don't be silly. I merely raided your enzymes and warmed up a batch. Just an idea. Uh, where'd you put the drops? They're in that little bakelite box over there. Oh. You remember the way the drops burned the toad's stomach? 
Well, I was wondering if I could make the same thing happen again, artificially. So you're going to lure one of the drops into that witch's brew of yours. That's the idea. There. Well, take it easy. They're the only links with the big one. Mm. Now, let's see how we're getting on. No, nothing. Give it another moment or two. The big globe killed the tramp, if my idea is correct. He must have seen the thing coming out of the lake, turned to run and fallen on his back. Yeah. I think he picked exactly the wrong place to fall. On grapefruit. All Mama wanted to do was to pick up her offspring. She couldn't help it if there was a body in the way. No. It's no good. This idea is never going to work. And she killed just the same. Those old doom roller stories hint that she may have done it before. And Willie, unless something is done soon, she'll do it again. I don't like it, Commander. Ian's got something up his sleeve. He goes off in the jeep in the mornings and doesn't come back until noon. When I ask him where he's been, he says he just went into town to see Jan. But visiting hours are from two to four. If he doesn't go to the hospital, where does he go? Have you seen this, Willie? It might explain a few things. Well, we pay cash for certain unusual minerals, highest prices, free pickup. Samples wanted are round, transparent, amber-colored with metallic veining. Hurry, right today, Box 236, Port Grand, Michigan. I take it you weren't acquainted with this. Hmm. You know what he plans to do? No, but I know what I'd do. There's some kind of an attraction between the big globe and the drops, a, a force that draws the little ones home to Mama when they hear her call. Uh, we found that out with the drop at Ian's Lodge. But that attraction is so great that it works the other way, too. You see what happened in the case of Miss Wright. If the drops can't come, if we hold them back, Mama comes after her children. And that's what Ian will probably count on. You mean he'll use the drops from the ad for bait? What's a man to do? He, he can't let it go free. Now, Ian knows nobody's going to believe his doom roller story, so he's going to do something about it himself. I believe your damn doom roller yarn, but it doesn't do any good. I'd earn the biggest haw-haw from here to the streets of Mackinac if I tried to initiate an official search for a round, glowing thing 20 foot high. The world won't unite simply because Michigan has itself a monster, you know. And what can I do? Even if I do take the launch out and prowl around the lake, maybe Ian Thorne knows how to catch monsters, but I certainly don't. You want to let him go on, I suppose. Well, personally, I'd hate to see him get his hide fried off when he's just beginning to think of settling down. Settling down? Well, he sends sheaves of flowers and boxes of chocolates and fruit to the hospital every day. It can't be that he's just interested in Jeanne's experience with a monster. Oh, all right. I'll do anything I can. You watch him, that's all. And let me know when you think he's going to pull something. Keep your eyes open. All we can do is wait. Nifty. Looks as though it's going to be hot when it lifts. Oh, so that knapsack, will you, Willie? Huh? Oh. Hey, what's all this stuff here? Thanks. Don't wait, lunch. I'll be gone for most of the day. After I've had a look around, I'm going down to the hospital to see Jeanne. I may be quite late. They must be sick of the sight of you. You've been down there every day this week. And why the hell do you want to go out to the dunes on a day like this? It'll be much too hot. All the more reason. The rock pools are drying up now. The life's beginning to look really fascinating. Have you seen the collecting bottles, Willie? Hmm? Oh, on the table over there. Thanks. Well, so long, Willie. Keep the home fires burning. Yeah. Send out a search party if I'm not back after dark. Yeah. I'll keep the home fires burning. Who does he think he's fooling? I went down to the rock pools yesterday. They're still full of water from the last storm. He's taken the jeep. What on earth is he up to? The box he's got in the back. Where did he leave the binoculars? Now. Yeah, now. A wooden crate of some kind. Something's written on it. We weren't jolting about so much I could see what it says. Van der... Van der... Vries. Something else. Looks like danger. It's gone. Too late, Jeanne. Your favorite ecologist just drove over the desert sands and... It... 
Hey, what are you doing around loose? Loose? Well, I've been out of hospital for five days now. I've been staying with Uncle, waiting for Ian to show up. I got tired of sitting around meekly all day, so here I am. Did Ian know you were out? Well, what do you mean? Of course he knew. He drove me back from the hospital. Well, I'll be damned. He's been telling me he's been going down to the hospital every day to see you, and all the while he's... Jen, does the name Van der Vries mean anything to you? Oh, sure. They're a big demolition and explosive firm. They used to have a depot next to where Uncle had his office in Port Grand. It's what? Demolition. I think Ian has gone out on the dunes today in search of the big roller, the one that chased you. He said he was going to the rock pool, but I managed to have a look into his knapsack. It was full of little metal cylinders and some kind of a gadget must have been the detonator. Oh, we'll just stop him quickly. Well, he took the jeep. We'd never catch him. You've no idea where he might be heading. No, not one. We could follow the tracks of the jeep... That would take hours, and even then he might use it for only part of the trip. Now, where would you set a trap for a monster if you wanted to blow it up without doing too much damage? Where you wouldn't be disturbed? Mount Cook. Uh, what? Mount Cook. It's an outside sand dune about 150 feet high, and there's a kind of hollow at the peak. He used to go there with Ian. And, and that's where you think he'd go? Well, there's nowhere else that I know of. It's the only place where he could be sure of no one getting hurt. How far? Oh, about 15 miles. Well, isn't there any way we could borrow a car or something? Yeah. Uncle was coming over to pick me up in an hour or so, but well, he may take ages. Well, we could try some of the shacks down the road, but our best plan would be to try to contact Commander Cunningham. Do you know how the radio transmitter works? Uh, there's not much idea, but if it's anything like that. Well, let's try. Let's try. It's our best chance. We've got to get in touch with Cunningham somehow before Ian gets to Mount Cook. From the peak of the dune, the hills rolled away in gentle green waves towards the farmlands and orchards in the east and the brilliant blue lake in the west. The spires of Port Grand poked out of the mist a few miles down the shore and white sails appeared off the promontory that hid the entrance to the river harbor. You wouldn't think you could see so far from here. Twelve o'clock, time to start work. We'll start with the drops first, I think. Seven. Not as many as I'd hoped for, but enough, I think. Gosh, it's hot. Willie was right. It's a real scorcher. One way or another, it looks as though I'm going to end up fried. Now, the rain's in a circle on top of the monster trap. Good. Push them firmly into the sand so they won't run away without very good cause. Give him a final tap to make sure. See the red light will do. Now for the charges. Nope, now for lunch. It's going to be a long wait before the sun goes in. Slightly soggy have and pickle. Well, well, I might find a few blackberries around if I'm lucky. No use, Jan. We must have contacted every radio ham enthusiast in Michigan by now, and nobody lives anywhere near Fort Grant. Well, there must be something here. Uncle used to get in touch with lots of people around here. It's, it's the wrong time of day or something. If only he'd get here. I thought you said he should be back by now. No, he may be any time. He wanted to get something for the car, and let's try again. Yeah, okay. You keep on at it until Mac gets here. I'm going down to the road to see if I can't borrow a car or something. If you contact Cunningham, tell him to get his boys off to Mount Cook right away. If you can't, well, you'll just have to wait until Mac arrives. But what can you do even suppose you get there? I can try and stop Ian from doing anything too stupid. And that's the most we can hope for. I should have brought another can of beer. I've never felt so thirsty. And the blackberries are all gone. The sun's going down now. There's a bit of shade at last. What's the time? I wonder. It's nearly four. How much longer now? A good day for catching monsters, Dr. Paul? <laughs> Willie, what the hell? <laughs> I thought I'd come out and watch you giving your rock pulls the once over. But you're a bit out of the way, aren't you? Look, Willie, get out of here quickly. This is my affair, and I don't want you or anybody else mixed up in it. <laughs> yeah, don't give me that strong, silent Englishman stuff. You're not the type... And I haven't given up the best days of my vacation to your monster for nothing. Anyway, I've just finished the last can of beer. Well, I am not going back to fetch another. It's taken me four hours to find my way to this place, and I'm staying put, thank you very much. Now, 
How about making a fellow at home and explaining just what you're aiming to do? All right, Willie. If you want to get your eyebrows thinned off, that's your own affair. There aren't any more of you, are there? No, just me. Well, unless Cunningham gets here, which doesn't seem very likely. I left Jan trying to contact him with your transmitter. Jan? <laughs> yeah. Your poor, helpless hospital patient. All right, come on in. What's it all about? Well... You see that little ring out there glinting in the sun? Mm. They're all drops like the others we found. Uh, you see, I... Uh, you needn't bother tell me how you got them. I saw your ad. Well, buried in the sand underneath them is enough neo-nitro to blow Mama sky high if she comes after a little one. And with a bait like this, I've no reason to doubt that she will. And what are you aiming to do while all this is going on? I'm going to sit quietly here under this juniper tree, wait for Mama to settle down on her young, or whatever she does... And then press the start of this little transmitter. Well, all right, all right. Don't play around with it like that. I understand the principle. Shut up. Oh, what? Don't you see? One of them's moving. The big one. Hey, it's going down the hill. Oh, it won't get far. There's a pile of sand in the way. Don't you believe it. See, it's going right, right up at over the top. Well, that's that. But we can't just sit here and watch them all run away. I don't think they'll all run away like that one. It was the biggest, after all. But let's go and give the others a tap to make sure. Nearly six o'clock. Beginning to get dark. Your monster's pretty cagey. It may know we're here. <laughs> Look at them. The sun's nearly gone now, but they're still glowing. A little constellation. Well, maybe right. What do you mean? About the constellation, I mean. Where else could this thing have come from, after all? It, it's not terrestrial, surely. No. No, it, it was one thing the boys over at Ann Arbor were sure of. It was, it was nothing like these things anywhere on Earth. That's a meteor, then. It could have exploded somewhere over the lake, and the something inside it, a well, life, if you like, made it put itself together, made it wander around the dunes, picking up fragments of itself. Picking up? Oh, you know, like mercury, little drops of it joining up together. But this thing is deadly, Ian. It's malignant. Are we to suppose it has some kind of intelligence? It does. One of them's on the move again. We can't let that happen. Got it. We're not going to get away as easily as that. Watch the others, Willie. I think it must be pretty near now. Why? They wouldn't have moved the little one as easily as that. It all looks so forbidding here now. I used to bring Jeanne up here. She caught her sandal in a twig somewhere just round here. She had a yellow flower in her hair. It's here, Willie. I know it's here. I can almost see it. Look at the way the drops are glowing now. Jeanne! She must have come up here with Mac. Go and stop her quickly, Willie. Hit her off. I don't mind you sticking your neck out, but we must get her out. All right, but be careful. I'll keep Jan out of the way somehow. Good luck, Ian. I'm sure it's here, hiding among the trees somewhere. The drops are glowing like mad now. Why doesn't it come? Come out and chase me like you chased her.
Ian? Ian? He's opening his eyes. I think he's coming around. Oh, I'll bet you in there. What is it? It's like looking out through a mask. What's this thing over my face? Bandages. You look like something they dug up in the Valley of the Kings. How am I? Uh, medium rare. Oh, you crazy fool. No, don't try and raise your arm. Oh. Now, that'll teach you. Now, you just lie quiet. We'd have been there with you. That is, if Willie hadn't let us off on a wild goose chase. Is it gone? Atomized. You should see the crater in the sand. But we'll still have some small ones to study. Your ad brought in four more today. And all of us think they can swing a nice, fat research grant so you can carry on the good work. Oh. He says he's sticking to ecological studies of the Michigan Dunes, Chapter 8. <laughs> no more Dune Rollers, thank you. You better surrender, Willie. Jen's got her mind made up, and I know what that can mean. Oh. <laughs> but the size of that thing, Ian. I only caught a glimpse of it as Willie was dragging us away in the opposite direction, but uh, I've never seen anything like it. And you never will again, Mac. I think we've seen the last of the Dune Roller. But the moon rode high over a blackened crater in the sand. Two of the grains of sand, which gleamed in the moonlight a bit more golden than the rest, tumbled down together into a sheltered hollow to begin again the work of 300 years. By Julian May, Patrick Barr played the young poem, Guy King's Encounter, the Shepherd, 